So uh, today, uh, Peter from the Danish uh, section is going to talk about uh, how the international uh, production system increases global um, um, ecological inequality um, with the example of um, food production. Thank you very much. I will be giving the presentation in English, so I hope that all the translations are ready. I hope that everybody had a good party yesterday. You all look happy and uh, this seems to me that everything went very well yesterday, so that's great. All right, so let us begin. I think the question about agriculture is a very underdeveloped subject on the left wing and also in our current. At least, that is to say, in the part of the world where we are now, let's just call it the global north. In the global south, we have a lot of examples, also from our own comrades, that the question of agriculture plays a key role in the activities of the left wing and of our sections. Right now, our comrades in Pakistan are fighting a fierce battle to protect landless uh, persons who are tenants of land in the region of Fukara. They are attacked by police, terror laws are being applied against them, the leaders are being put in jail and punished, police attacks on houses, so on, horrible situation. From the Filipino comrades who could unfortunately not be here this year, we know of a lot of very important work in helping the peasant communities in Mindanao, helping to set up uh, self-sustainable farms, helping to create uh, energy that is renewable, so on. From the Brazilian experience of building the PT, we know of the enormous position that the Momento Santera, MST, had and still has in the Brazilian context. And on the question of the struggle against climate change and for ecological justice, we know of the huge importance played by the social movement, La Via Campesina, which organizes uh, small farmers and peasants around the world. So to say that the question of agriculture is underdeveloped is also to say this question is underdeveloped in Europe, in the US. It's not underdeveloped as such, but as a collective, we cannot go back and find the FI resolution on agriculture and this is how we think it should be and so on and so forth. Thus, what we're doing here is that we are opening a discussion. I'm not coming here as a professor trying to tell you about how you should see this. I'm trying to open some points of views that will make it possible for us to develop both our practice and our theory. And I think it's very important to underline that in order to do this, we must engage in the actual struggles around food production and agriculture, but we will get to that. So, coming from two days where I think the theme of reproduction have been discussed in different ways, we are going to stay inside the theme of reproduction because the production of food is, in many ways, the first condition of the reproduction of any society, even a capitalist society. So, it comes as no surprise either that women produce and distribute the majority of the world's food. This is not uh, acknowledged by the UN and so on, of course. This is very much in formal economies, but it's very important to underline that the tendencies we have seen, the discussions on feminism, this also translates into the food industry at a global level. Not only, going back to the question of food, does food uh, constitute a primary condition for reproduction? The price of food in itself conditions the price of labor in any society. Price of labor, as we know, is the price of the reproduction of the time that a worker has to spend 
And reproducing this means that the workers must be fed, their families must be fed, and so on. When the price of food falls, this will also be one of the conditions in the development of wages. But obviously, as we know, there are many conditions. But just to say, food is a prime condition on the price of labor. The food industry relates to labor and the proletariat in another way, and we will see this in a moment. I am not going to try to make a complete vista about the development of agriculture and food for, since forever. I will try to focus on the development of ag industrial agriculture, on the meaning of the so-called Green Revolution that started in the 30s, about how this uh, development translated into the neoliberal age, and lastly, I hope that we have time to just give a few pointers to what we are able to do. But if I don't have time, I am sure that I see a lot of competent comrades and that the interventions and the comments will be able to touch upon this subject. So, the roots of industrial agriculture trace back a long time. Um, and we have a series of roots that are all intertwined and cannot be seen isolated but overlaps and meet each other several times during history. The first root is the forced appropriation of land. We all know about the enclosure of the commons. This is uh, the classic story about the proletarization of the British, uh, the British peasantry the transformation into a city proletariat and the ability to fuel the wool industry of, uh, of the British Empire. Much more large scale and important, unfortunately, is the genocide of millions of indigenous people in the Americas, constituting the prime condition for the appropriation of vast swathes of land across the Midwest, across Barbados, the Caribbean islands, Brazil, Argentina, so on. Second condition that relates to the first is the development of plantations in the Caribbean islands seen as large areas of monocultural crop in this case, sugar canes, powered by slave labor and being developed in a way that was way more capitalized than contemporary agriculture was across the globe at this time. I think in this way, it's important to note how slavery and genocide was a very important premises of industrialization and especially in the industrialization of agriculture and I think we should remember this when uh, we try to further develop our thoughts on this. The second level, the, the third level was the transformation, transformation of grazing lands into arable lands. After enclosing the commons it was possible decades later to transform grazing lands for... Oh. All right. So I just mentioned the enclosure of the commons. This was to have sheep used in the wool industry. This was later transformed into arable land, very nitrogen rich because uh, the sheep had gone around shitting in the fields, you know, that's how agriculture works. Then there was, and this is also very important, a lowering of the work intensity inside agriculture. On one hand, by machination, introduction of more machines. But at the final analysis, an attempt by early capitalism to transform agriculture into maximization of profit which was a break, even back then, 
from what we could call best known practices in agriculture. <coughs> then, same time, and related to the lowering of the work intensity, there was the import from abroad of import from outside of fertilizers in Britain where the first steps were taken in the development of industry in agriculture. This was uh, bones from the Napoleonic War and bad shit from South America. So it is really possible to say, considering these facts, that modern industrial agriculture, as Marx once wrote, about another subject, rose covered in blood and dirt. Moving on, we see a very important breaking point in the approach to industrial agriculture that happens around the 1930s, to be exact, in the year 1935. In this year, the US government initiates what becomes known as the Green Revolution. Some of you might know about the Green Revolution as an anti-communist project. It was this, but it was so much else. The Green Revolution consisted in a combined string of technological advances, infrastructural changes, state intervention into agriculture, transforming the agricultural landscape, first of the US and then of the globe, in a radical way. It was a move towards monocultural fields, large-scale monocultural fields, a vast reduction of biodiversity in agriculture, that is the transplantation of different locally based seeds and plants with generalized seeds that were the most efficient. I will get to that in a second. It was a massive capitalization of the agricultural sector, that is a rise in the organic composition of agriculture, reduction of work hours, improvement of capital investment in agriculture. This happens through machines, through fertilizers, so on. And then going back to the plant, it was, with a very difficult word, hybridization. So what does this mean? Hybrid seeds were introduced by seed companies. These were inbred seeds that had been crossed and paired throughout a scientific process to create seeds with higher yields under specific conditions being a certain use of fertilizer, a specific use of water. But since these seeds were inbred, since they were a Frankenstein monster, of course not in the way of the GMOs, but in the way that they were not able themselves to reproduce as well as their forefathers. We could call these seeds the mules of cereals. The seeds would grow worse by the year, and already back then this meant that farmers became trapped in a very close relation to the seed companies. The sustainability of farming, of traditional farming, where the seeds of one year's produce could be used the year after to plant the next uh, row of crops, was abandoned in favor of the buying of seeds from big companies who also happened to be the producers of the fertilizer needed for these seeds to have optimal conditions. It was and this is in contrary to what we just heard about the roots of capitalism, not the appropriation of land, at least not over on the ground, but the vast appropriation of another geological layer. That is, 
the vast appropriation of the world oil reserves and their insertion into agriculture, partly through machines, partly through fertilizer, because fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, so on, are very energy consuming products. All right, so the translation of oil into food through the production of fertilizers, through the production of herbicides and pesticides. You can just say pesticides if you don't find the word for the other one. And the last part of this geological appropriation was the insertion of mass amounts of water into agriculture. So, from the 30s onwards, the use of water in agriculture rises dramatically. So we have the water layer, we have the oil layer. These layers are being appropriated into agriculture instead of expanding the area where agriculture is being made. All right, just a short note to explain. When we have a field and we grow anything, we will deplete the nutrients of the soil in order to reintroduce these nutrients first we saw how the british were able to import the bones of the dead and the shit of exotic birds in latin america now we see how it was possible to bring in the energy from the oil to produce fertilizers in order to give to the soil the nutrients that had been taken away by growing cereals, corn, maize, whatever. <coughs> Fourth, it was a national agriculture. That is, it was a state-led agriculture. It was based on national planning, national incentives, like giving money to farmers who transformed their agriculture into this specific way of working that was in line with the ideas of the Green Revolution. It was also state-led in the USSR, the Soviet Union, and the allied countries of the Soviet Union who learned about agriculture from the Americans during the years of the Second World War and right after that. And it was a highly specialized agriculture, deciding this place, we grow this crop, here we grow that crop, fruits, we have to grow them there, and so on. If we want to look at a contemporary example that some of us might know, we can look to the way the European Union is giving subsidies to agriculture, destroying food sovereignty in, the, in each of the specific European countries, creating conditions where, no, where very few countries are able to feed their own populace within the European Union, but are very dependent on an overall plan that has been brought about by the subsidies of the European Union. Let's take Denmark. Denmark, 50 years ago, had lots of uh, fruit plantations. Now, there are very few fruit plantations, only idealist and staunch word uh, food farmers, uh, or fruit farmers still have plantations in Denmark. I'm sure all of you will know, or could ask your parents or grandparents, about types of crops that are no longer being grown in your area. And I think everybody will be able to see, driving home from here, coming to here, the vast swathes of monocultural fields that define the European agriculture. And it is very important for us to state this has been a political project from the 30s onwards. So what, so what was the result of this green revolution? The results were enormous. 
the serial output, the global serial output grows by 126% between 1950 and 1918. The yearly fall in food prices between 1952 and the 70s is 3%. I want to remind you again, when I give these numbers, it's because it relates directly to the price of labor in a capitalist society. There is, between the 60s and the turn of the millennia, a decline in real prices by 60%. And lastly, I will stop with the... Oh. All right. So only two more uh, statistics, I promise, for now. <laughs> so there is between 1960 and 2000, the year 2000, a 60% decline in, in prices based on this model of agriculture. And lastly, this is three statistics in one. So it happens between 1935 and 1970. And these numbers are amazing. The labor intensity in agriculture, this, the amount of human labor going into agriculture, falls by two-thirds. Meanwhile, the role of machines rises by 213 percent. And fertilizer and pesticide use rise by a whooping 1338 percent in this period. This is a radical transformation of agriculture within the statistic. Okay, and fertilizer and pesticide use rise by 1,338%. This is a radical transformation of the way agriculture is being done. So, how does this relate to global inequality? This agricultural model was exported to the Global South in two waves. First, it was exported as a model of development where agriculture was being characterized as a certain industry and being treated as such in developmental patterns after the Second World War. Secondly, after the debt crisis of the early 80s after the oil crisis of the 70s with the rise of neoliberal capitalism, it was reintroduced as a structural adjustment, liberalizing these national food systems that had been established beforehand. What does this mean? It meant a massive loss of culture and a cultural and historical relation to the food that was grown and was consumed across the, glo the globe, but especially in the global south, were grains, uh, were strains from northern agriculture, was copied onto societies that had different traditions, had different cultural relations to their food, and so on. Just an example. I visited the wonderful country Georgia last summer. This country had, before the Soviet Union, up around just below 300 different types of grapes that they used to make wine. This is a, historically a wine-producing country, so one of the first wine-producing countries of the world. This was, during the Soviet era, reduced to 15. This is a huge loss of culture. We will see this pattern repeat all over the world. Different types of maize in Central America, different types of rice in Asia, 
all this create, recreated as monocultural visions of agriculture. Also, it meant an immense loss of food independence and natural wealth through deforestation, through export of food, and through a pressure in prices, especially during the neoliberal era, where overproduction in the global north led to the destruction of small-scale agriculture in the south. So this transformation of the agriculture, national agriculture to agro, to agro export, was realized through a debt regimen. The debt of these countries was used to force them into a liberalization of their natural, national agricultures. That is the buying up both of big local capitalists, but especially by capitalists from abroad of the land and thus of the produce of the land. This led to massive proletarization. Millions of people floated into cities, creating the now known mega cities. This is also a way to measure proletarization because these are people that have been disowned from the land and disowned from the means of producing their own reproduction. It led to malnutrition because these hybrid grains were never meant or never produced to be nutrient rich. They were produced to give a high yield, give a lot of money, not give a full stomach. It was the development of biofuels and the criminal transformation of food into fuel which opened up a whole new vista for the speculation of financial capital in agriculture. And it was the continuation, the rapid continuation of concentration of capital in agriculture, meaning for example, and we will see these examples all over the world, also here in Europe, that by 2010, only 12% of the U.S. farmers controlled 88% of the farm value. It meant toxification with Roundup, with DDT, with uh, 2,4-DT, 2,4-D, which is the active, agent, the active part of Agent Orange. We know from the Vietnam War, this horrible chemical that was used against the Vietnamese. It was from the mid-90s onwards, the introduction of GMOs that during five years alone rose from zero to 10% of the global agriculture. 50% of the world GMOs are placed in the global south where it is forced upon people held down through the step regimen that I mentioned earlier. It was the machination of nature at a large scale. Just for an example, 80% of all bees in the United States are industrial bees. They're driven around in huge trucks, transformed from being a species that pollinate an area within two kilometers of the hives. The hives now are spread over Hundreds of hectares moved thousands of miles per year. Surely this combined with the toxic, toxic uh, environment on a conventional agricultural field is a prime cause of this colony collapse disorder or B-Margeddon as some have called it. The vast dying off of the bees. Already now we see in South China how apple farmers have to hand pollinate their plants. This is not conductive to any idea about socialism as a regime of free time and the right of being lazy. Because if we have to pollinate the crops ourselves in order to eat, I assure you there will be a lot of work for all of us in the years to come. <laughs> But also it has to do with meat production. Today, 
around three-fourths of the infectious diseases ravaging the earth originates in animals or in meat production. This machination of nature has a way of turning upon itself and punishing those who created it. So, all right, the, the last one. All right, so three fourths of the infectious diseases that ravage the earth today originate in animal or meat production. The production of animals, the production of meat. We know it from uh, the poultry flu that uh, there was a big problem a few years ago. We have big problems with uh, cows, with pork, becoming resistant to medicine, threatening to put back our medical development hundreds of years, so on. And this specu speculative bubble created by neoliberalism in agriculture led to price spikes that had hitherto been unheard of. So the thing about the Green Revolution was that it was it was the promise of the abolition of hunger and it was marketed as such but the backside of the coin was that during neoliberalism and even before that but in different ways but during neoliberalism this transformed into a new regime of hunger because food and agriculture was opened in a massive way to speculation and I want to say that all these things, all of them, continue to signify that the small farms of the world and the majority of the world's farms are less than two hectares and they keep getting smaller. They keep destroying small farmers, peasants. They keep pressing people out of agriculture and this goes especially for women who work in agriculture and the food industry. And I want to underline this. It is not true that the neoliberal agricultural model have been efficient in any way. GM, the introduction of GMOs have not significantly raised yields across the globe. It might have preserved yields but it has increased toxification around the world. It has increased the dependency of farmers on the agrochemical complex. It has created, it, this has created the conditions where criminal corporations like Nestlé can argue that water is not a human right because they want the water not only to sell you in plastic bottles for high prices, but also in order to keep controlling the agricultural system. So, what are the ways out of these problems? As I stated before, the, vast ma the majority of the world's food is produced by small-scale farmers. One-fourth of the farmlands in the world produce the majority of the food that is actually consumed. That is food consumed by humans, not made into foodstuff for animals, not made into fuels, taken from the fields, brought to the market, exchanged for money, bartered for other food, exchanged through local communities with the right to define and know what people are eating themselves. All of this creates very important questions that I'm not going to answer today and I don't think I have the answers about what is worth in this world. What is value in this world when the price of food can only rise creating hunger 
then value once again, and I hope that you will see this in many of the workshops today, value loses its meaning once the ecological aspect of socialism is brought in. Capitalist notion of value is the value of nothing, it is the value of hunger, it is the value of thirst, it is the value of suffocation by the toxification of the air we breathe. These systems are not efficient. They are, it takes now a conventional agricultural system around 20 calories to produce one calorie. It is hopelessly inefficient, whereas small-scale farmers are way more efficient. But they have more people, more actual humans engaged in agriculture, and this is why it is more efficient. I think we need to understand and rediscover the traditions of our grandparents, these traditions in many parts of the world are guarded by the indigenous communities, approaches to farming, approaches to the land, approaching approaches to food consumption. I think we need to make long-term strategic alliances with organic farmers, organic farmers collectives, I think we need to engage in producer-to-consumer networks. This includes heightening our organization in the second level food production. I don't say this because I'm a baker myself. But it is important to engage with people who can transform cereals and the agricultural produce into readily digestible and healthy food for people. If we are, as the Spanish comrades say, and I agree with them on this, to create a poder popular, a popular power, the first question that the popular, the people, are going to ask themselves is what are we going to eat during this popular power? And I think even at this camp, we can see that we have difficulties <laughs> organizing the production, distribution, and consumption of sustainable, cheap food. I think this has to do with the fact that we are not very well implanted in these areas. La Via Campesina have promised that their way of doing agriculture could cool the planet. That the sustainable organic planting of crops, the efficient use of farmland, the abandonment of machines, could help cool the planet that capitalist agriculture, as one of the largest sinners in climate change, they contribute 18% of the effects towards climate change, have created. We're talking about working together with indigenous communities in restoration of biodiversity, reclaiming the seeds of our grandparents, reclaiming the traditions, the knowledge that we have been taught to forget. Of course, there are pitfalls moving into this, especially in Europe and in the North, but also in the South, we will experience conflicts, class conflicts within the agriculture, agricultural sector itself, between those that have a small productive apparatus, and for example, the landless peasants, of Brazil, these people do not necessarily share the same interests. But we need to be engaged in these movements, finding out and developing ways of talking about, thinking about, working with food in order to develop 
the demands and the forms in which we can envisage a socialist agricultural economy. And I think that this is a very, very, very important part of the class struggle today. I will close up just a note on the Greek tragedy that we saw unfold last year. It seems to me that one of the big problems of the Greek state was that its agricultural sector had been transformed in a way that did not allow the feeding of the Greek population from within its own borders. The biodiversity of an agriculture that could feed the people and keep its traditions alive had been replaced by the large-scale production of olive oil and feta cheese based on European Union subsidies. I think discussing the plan B, discussing how to fight against these things, that we should insist that these subsidies are no longer given to monoculture, that it is to, for the people to decide what kind of food we want, how we want it, and not to be forced into a food regimen that only works to create lower wages, to proletarianize the world, and to remove us from the soil that could feed and keep us. Thank you very much.